Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is June the 8th, 2024. Let's focus on the heavyweight division. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, for premium subscribers that Volney, Stephen Butler, Hedge delivered, the underdog, to my surprise, actually delivered. We had a piece of the action. There should be a little bit extra change in your bank account this morning. Let's talk about the heavyweight division. Let's be blunt here. Right, let's be as blunt as we can be. Uh, remember, the risk is all yours. Alexander Usyk won't be able to hold on to all of the heavyweight belts. There's a reason why more than two decades passed since Lennox Lewis was undisputed, and even he was only undisputed for a brief period of time. There are many sanctioning bodies. There are many mandatories. Things change quickly. Let's also pivot here. Let's talk about the current odds. They are a bit of a stunner. Tyson Fury right now going off at a plus 150 for the rematch against Usyk. Let me just say, I'm a big Tyson Fury fan. I'm not grabbing the plus 150. Right now, I have a wait-and-see attitude, even though the plus 150 is tempting. But I want people to revisit that fight. Just understand, we knew going in that there was a coordination gap. It showed itself in the fight. Usyk's the better athlete. Usyk is never dazed and confused in that fight. You see a fight like that and you notice that Tyson Fury won't throw his left hook, just like Anthony Joshua wouldn't throw his left hook against Usyk. Then you realize Usyk is so fast, doesn't convey itself on film, but Usyk's straight left is so effective that guys are afraid to give Usyk the opportunity to counter with that straight left. So the left hook that Fury has, which is a weapon for him, taken right off his shoulder. So there's a coordination gap. We know that right now it's unclear whether Tyson Fury has any answers, and I mean any answers, for Usyk's straight left, right? Usyk's bludgeoning him with that punch in the second half of the fight. Also, with regard to the second half of the fight, there's a stamina gap. It's obvious now. There's one thing to come back against a Nganu in the later rounds. It's a totally different thing to try to come back against an Usyk in the later rounds. I also didn't like the pacing here, right? I'd grab the 150 if... Tyson Fury was the one who finished strong. He wasn't. He's the one who started fast and then faded in the second half of the fight. As I've said, there's always a risk in rematches of the rematch starting in the 13th round of the first fight. In my opinion, Usyk was in control in the later rounds. That's how he comes back. That's how he wins the fight. He was in control in the later rounds of their first fight. That should make you hesitant to grab even the plus 150 on Tyson Fury. Now, everything has a price. If this price continues to deteriorate, I'll revisit it. But just understand, right now, I'm hesitant to bet on the Usyk Fury rematch, even though I concede. The first fight could have gone either way. Now, one of the better fights, one of the better opponents that Usyk has faced, because Usyk, understand, is more challenged by smaller guys than he is bigger guys. His game is made to beat big, lesser coordinated heavyweights. One of the better challengers that he faced 
was Michael Hunter. Michael Hunter now has some elevated position for the WBA belt. I believe Hunter is a WBA interim champion. Right? Just understand, it was a tough fight for Usyk the first time around. Hunter, who's known for his stamina, faded in that fight. I believe it would be one of the tougher fights for Usyk the second time around. Right? Usyk, in other words, has a choice here. He can go for big money because he is recognized by the public as the lineal. Right? He's recognized, however they strip him, whatever they do, he's recognized as the real heavyweight champion. Right? Once you're unified, people understand, okay, this was the man at one time who had all the belts. There's a section of the public, let me raise my hand, there's a section of the public that is going to be of the mindset of, hey, if he had all the belts at one point and he hasn't lost since then, well, he's the champ, right? So just understand what's going to happen here. Usyk, who knows boxing. Usyk, who privately spars with people like Martin Bacoli, right? If you believe the Bacoli people, Bacoli drops him in sparring. Just food for thought, right? But understand, Usyk is one of these guys who's always in shape. Maybe he's older, but he's lived a more dedicated life a life more committed to boxing and being physically elite than, let's say, a Tyson Fury, who had detours, who had substance abuse problems. Right? Just understand the lay of the land here. So Usyk knows. He knows that Michael Hunter is a tough matchup for him. Michael Hunter is a tougher matchup for Usyk than is Daniel Dubois. Right? I don't see Usyk fighting him. Let's go one step further. If Anthony Joshua beats Daniel Dubois, and we'll talk about that fight, right? What's in it for Usyk in fighting Joshua a third time? Understand, Joshua's dangerous. He's blessed with punching power. Maybe things are different now. Because, of course, Joshua's with a new trainer, Ben Davidson. Right? But understand, Usyk has cover. Because Joshua's last two fights were against Otto Wallen and Francis Ngannou. Right? If you're looking at the fights, Joshua... Box office king might be the people's choice for a big fight, but he hasn't earned it, right? He has critics out there. Google Lennox Lewis's comments, right? Joshua has critics out there. At this point of his career, understand Usyk's all about legacy, right? He doesn't need to prove to anyone that he could beat Joshua a third time because he's already proved to the history books and the historians that he can beat Joshua twice. Right? So understand, if the IBF follows its own bylaws and strips Usyk, if Joshua beats Dubois, Usyk really has no incentive to fight it. If Dubois beats Joshua, understand, there too. Usyk's already beaten Dubois. There is a little bit of intrigue, though, because there are people running around, let me raise my hand here too, who believe that Dubois got ripped off in that first fight, that that body punch was legit, that body punch was the best punch professionally to ever land on Usyk. So, Usyk might have an incentive there. It would be a unification match. Dubois would have the IBF part of the belt, right? Um, you know, there is an incentive there if Usyk wants the fight. 
if Usyk is willing to have titles hit the floor, right? You remember Riddick Bowe famously threw some titles in the garbage at one point. No heavyweight history. If Usyk is prepared to walk away from that title, right, because he feels he's already beaten Dubois, he has historical cover, right, because that Dubois fight did not go the distance. Whatever you think happened with that body punch, the idea is going to be, well, but for that body punch, Usyk dominated the rest of the fight. Usyk gave him a shot. And Usyk won the fight by stoppage. Right? But you and I know what's really going on here. If Usyk lets some belts hit the floor, it's in part because he understands that the public doesn't fully appreciate Michael Hunter. By the way, I encourage people to go to Box Rack right now and look at where he is ranked in the United States. Right? Hunter is highly ranked. The public doesn't seem to realize it. I believe Usyk himself understands that a fight against Hunter stylistically would be a very difficult matchup for him. Let's talk about Daniel Dubois. Let's talk about Anthony Joshua. Right, folks? I believe Joshua is the betting side of the play here. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a dangerous fight. Daniel Dubois has power, has hand speed, is two-handed. If he lands, he'll knock you out. He always has a puncher's chance. Always. Right? But the narrative in the public on what happened in that Dubois-Ergovic fight is off. Folks, Dubois was getting dominated in that fight. Right? Revisit the first two rounds. Ergovic is landing so many right hands that you felt something was wrong. Let me just say, too, I see Joe Joyce taking a lot of heavy punches. In my opinion, that's a mistake. But understand, Joe Joyce hasn't fought that many times. Look at his number of professional fights. Understand, too, that Joe Joyce is in his 30s. He's several years into his 30s. He might not have the reflexes to get out of the way. Now, if you're a young guy, if you're in your mid-20s, like Daniel Dubois is, and you make a decision to take shots, that's a mistake. Sooner or later, your chin is going to give out. Sooner or later, the shots are going to start to impact your health. You don't want to fall into a pattern of thinking, I'll just take this guy's right hand. More importantly, as Joshua people know, Joshua's a blessed puncher. You can't take his right hand. Repeatedly. Like Dubois took Ergovic's right hand. Right? Joshua has... The clear advantage here. He has the experience. Joshua is a blessed puncher against the guy who's defensively challenged. But understand, Joshua's biggest advantage, in my opinion, is the skill set he had to learn, and he had to learn it. Let's not run from it. He had to learn it for the Andy Ruiz rematch. Because Joshua doesn't have the skill level to stay in the pocket with Andy Ruiz. Ruiz is much faster handed than Joshua. But Ruiz doesn't have the foot speed. So Joshua, who is an athlete, understood for that Ruiz rematch, he had to be on his back foot. Right, folks? It's Joshua's boxing ability. His back foot. That's what he needs to flash here against Daniel Dubois. Don't stay in the pocket against Daniel Dubois. That's a recipe for disaster. But if you could move away and be episodic, Dubois, who has a problem with pacing to begin with, right? Was that the same fighter 
in both the Joe Joyce fight where Dubois is tentative and confused and the Ergovic fight. And Ergovic's a better fighter than Joe Joyce, at least from this seat, where Dubois is willing to mix it up and there's no confusion. Understand, if you mix in a back foot intermittently, if you throw a jab and don't just rely on power shots like Ergovic was, you can switch off Daniel Dubois, can't you? Isn't this a fighter who was having some problems against Richard Lardy? So Joshua needs to think this one through. If he tries to be hyper-aggressive like Ergovic is in the first round of the Dubois fight, you're going to wake up Dubois. Dubois is going to answer fire with fire. But if you come in and you're shooting a jab and it's a friendly fight, even when you're a puncher with a big right hand that you plan to land later in the bout, you might switch off Dubois. Dubois might actually think to himself, this is a boxing match. He might not be as aggressive as he was against Ergovic. Understand though, even an aggressive Dubois lost, in my opinion, at least five rounds in the short seven round fight against Ergovic. I had Ergovic winning the first six rounds. Right? If Dubois fights that fight against AJ, he's not going to be able to withstand AJ's power. So if a Dubois AJ fight happens, I believe the most likely outcome is AJ to win. Right? Understand though, I get the feeling that fight ends by stoppage, one way or the other. So rather than take a guy simply to win, there, we might be dealing in the world of rounds and props and stuff like that. Let's just say, though, I would expect Anthony Joshua to win that fight. Right now, for gamblers, you know more than most that what happens off camera still happens. Right? The public actually thinks that Anthony Joshua deserves a shot at the title. Right? Because he was a former champion. Right? Somehow beating Francis Ngannou, you know, has made him worthy of the title. If you're a gambler, you're looking off screen. Right? Now, Michael Hunter, just understand, the public's not looking at him. The public barely knows him, even though he's 35 years old, which, by the way, places him at a younger age than Usyk. You understand that Hunter's real game is to beat big clunky heavyweights. You understand that if, and it's a distinct possibility, don't believe the line here. Right? If Martin Bacoli, who has sparred with Fury, who has sparred with Usyk, who if you believe Bacoli um, has sparred and has beaten up Daniel Dubois, if Martin Bacoli beats big baby Jared Anderson, right? Given that Deontay Wilder just lost, understand Michael Hunter overnight is going to be America's best option for a shot at the heavyweight title, right? Let me point out that there's another guy. I mentioned him. He hasn't fought anyone. He's an Olympic silver medalist named Richard Torres. Be aware of him, right? He's better than advertised and he's American, right? Well, just understand, if Michael Hunter gets a shot at the heavyweight title against anyone, he's going to be the big underdog. That's the setup for gamblers. If Martin Bacoli beats Big Baby and he gets a shot, at the heavyweight title against anyone. 
he's going to be the big underdog, even though, let's say, Dubois beats AJ. If Bacoli then fought Dubois, who's taking tough fights, right? Usyk, Ergovic, AJ. If Bacoli were to fight Dubois, there's a familiarity there that the public's unaware of. Right? Bacoli 6'6". Six, six. Dubois is not defensively blessed. Bacoli is offensively blessed, at least for the first six rounds. Right? So, to sum up, folks, the door to the heavyweight division is much more open than is being suggested. I expect Usyk to be stripped of the IBF title. Right? I expect it. Once that happens, and once we have lost the undisputed nature of the heavyweight title, I'm expecting Usyk to stay away from people like Michael Hunter. In other words, Usyk, who's in his late 30s, if he can't be undisputed, he might allow a few of these belts to hit the floor because he's already been undisputed at cruiser and heavy. He's already a certain first ballot Hall of Famer, even if he were to get knocked out in the first round of the rematch by Tyson Fury because he's already beaten Tyson Fury. Right? There's even talk of Usyk dropping back to cruiserweight. I don't believe that happens. Because Usyk is already in great shape, and I'm just here to tell you that when you get older, losing weight becomes a chore. Now, if Usyk decides to lose weight, understand you have an entire division, the Bridgerweight division, and understand Lawrence Bacoli, because of Bacoli's ability to use length, would be a very dangerous opponent for Alexander Usyk. Let me close by saying this. I know Usyk has talked about fighting until he's 40. Folks, 40 is not that far away for him. If he gets stripped of the IBF title, and if Anthony Joshua beats Dubois, I believe there's a very good chance that Usyk might retire. Right? Once you've been undisputed, is it really worth sticking around the sport? How would he enhance his reputation by continuing to fight on? If you have two wins over Anthony Joshua, what's the point of a third match? How would that help you? Don't get me wrong. I understand there is an answer out there. It would certainly help your bank account. I don't deny that taking, you know, high-paying fights helps you financially. But there is a point where a fighter understands that even the financial calculus is complicated. Right now, because he's been undisputed at cruiser and heavyweight, there's going to be a crowd out there that's going to make the case for Usyk being an all-time great. Folks, he's in the conversation. Understand, he's an Olympic gold medalist. Understand, he's unbeaten as I make this video. Now, that has a post-career market value. Right? You, you look at great fighters who retire unbeaten. And they have a certain authority to them, right? They're in demand. You know, a great fighter, take a Ray Leonard. Granted, Ray Leonard lost some matches, especially very late in his career. People need to remember the terrible Terry Norris fight, the Hector Macho Camacho fight, in part because both of those guys were great fighters and deserve recognition. But understand, Ray Leonard who hasn't fought for decades, is a guy who, when there's a big fight, you want to see him. Promoters are willing to pay him to be there. Right? He will, you know, 
be on TV commenting on the fighters. Even though Ray hasn't fought himself and hasn't been a boxing analyst on a regular basis, right? Chris Mannix analyzes more fights these days than Ray Leonard. But Ray Leonard, Julio Cesar Chavez, there are certain guys who you want to see because they convey a certain standard for the sport, right? There's a video, I posted it on my favorites page here on YouTube of Larry Holmes, who hasn't fought for decades, arguing with Roberto Duran, same thing, right? Fighters actually have a post-career. I will literally pull over to the side of the road to listen to a George Foreman interview on an upcoming fight. Right? Well, just understand, Usyk has that going on. He's unbeaten. His brand is unblemished. So why would he risk it against a Michael Hunter? Against an AJ? for a third fight when he already has the upper hand on AJ against a Daniel Dubois who he beat maybe those ribs are still sore maybe he has bad memories of Dubois he has historical cover because he fought Dubois you can't accuse him of dodging Dubois if the ref made a mistake well I was in the ring with the guy right don't blame me for the ref's mistake Understand, Lennox Lewis had the common sense, and it was common sense, not to fight Vitaly Klitschko again. And Lewis lucked out. He got cuffed around in those early rounds. He fought back. That fight was still up in the air. And then, of course, the cut ended the fight for Vitaly Klitschko. Right? One would have thought Lewis would have said, hey, we have unfinished business. Talk about a blockbuster high payday fight after that first fight. Where Lewis gets tested in a way that he wasn't tested before. Understand, the Oliver McCall knockout, the Hasim Rockman knockout was different than the systemic beatdown that Vitaly Klitschko administered on Lennox Lewis in the first three rounds of their fight. That's what it was. Right, but Lewis understood, hey man, I have historical cover here. I fought Vitaly Klitschko. No one could say that I didn't. Right, that he got cut, what, you're going to blame me for him getting cut in a fight? Right, Lewis had the common sense not to fight Vitaly Klitschko again. I believe Usyk might have the common sense not to fight either Anthony Joshua or Daniel Dubois again. Right, so if he beats Tyson Fury, and understand who Fury is, people like me believe he's the best of his generation. Right, outside, of course, of Usyk, who now has beaten him. Right, so understand, here you have Usyk arguably beating the lineal twice. If Usyk wins the rematch, what's left to prove in a deep heavyweight division? Is the risk worth the reward, even for the big payday you get in a tough fight, if there's a possibility that it might blemish your unblemished record, which has taken you several years to develop, right? Which has had you beating people like Maris Breedis at cruiserweight, that's Breedis' first loss. Right? Think about it. That's Breedis' first loss. Murat Gassiev, think about it. That's Gassiev's first loss at cruiserweight. Right? At heavyweight beating multiple heavyweight champions. Right? That's the resume. Joshua twice. If he beats Fury, he would beat Fury twice. Folks, a lot of guys would use that to leave the stage. Leave the stage on top. 20 years from now, you'll be like Ray Leonard, where they announce a fight you haven't fought for decades. 
The promoter wants you at the fight. You're getting VIP treatment. The promoter wants you giving interviews. The network wants you on interviews. You're just getting VIP treatment across the board. I would not be surprised if Alexander Usyk, after should he beat Tyson Fury in the rematch, I would not be surprised, given that he's in his late 30s, if he walks away from the sport. Right? Why fight Michael Hunter again? There too, he has historical cover. He beat Hunter. He's the only man, by the way, to beat Hunter professionally. Right? He beat Hunter. He beat Joshua. He beat Dubois. What's the point of the rematch? Which one of those guys can you claim that he's docked? So to sum up, I think the heavyweight division is open. Let's talk about Martin Bacoli. Something happened in sparring. Now, if Bacoli is being honest, <laughs> then Usyk knows Bacoli is a difficult matchup. Understand, Bacoli's two-handed, long-range hooker. Right? I cannot imagine Bacoli being bashful in throwing his left hook. Because Bacoli, since he's long range, since he's six six, is hard to counter, even for southpaws. Right? There's a familiarity. If I'm Alexander Usyk, why fight him? Sooner or later, you have to leave something on the table. Understand, Joe Fraser never fought Kenny Norton, and Fraser in an interview told you why. It's because he sparred with Kenny. As Fraser put it, Kenny knew me. Right? How many folks here who remember the heavyweight division in the 70s even realize that Kenny Norton, who fought Ali three times, right? Who fought Foreman? Uh, Kenny Norton never fought Joe Fraser because Joe, in sparring, knew enough about Kenny to understand this is not a guy I want outside of sparring. Right? Martin Bacoli might have that status with Alexander Usyk. Don't be surprised if Usyk, after two huge paydays for the Tyson Fury fights, right? And understand, that's following two huge paydays for the Anthony Joshua fights. Don't be surprised if Usyk decides, hey, I want my name mentioned with the best ever. Right, Lewis, Ali, right, Lennox Lewis. I'm going to walk away from the sport. I think my family has enough to make it now, financially. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I'm expecting the heavyweight title to be fractured. I'm expecting Anthony Joshua to beat Daniel Dubois. I'm expecting Fury to face some challenges in that rematch against Usyk. Maybe Fury answers the call. Right? Fury for the Deontay Wilder second fight was certainly a different fighter than he was the first fight. Maybe he and Sugar Hill will work something out. But understand... Tyson Fury could keep distance and dance away from a Vladimir Klitschko, from a Deontay Wilder. Does he have the decided foot speed advantage against an Alexander Usyk? What exactly is his solution, if any, to Usyk's straight left? The plus 150 is tempting. I'm not taking it right now. I need to figure out the lay of the land in the months to come. Let me point out too, Fury lost a lot of weight for that first fight. If he's at the same weight, the question for me is, is this weight loss affecting his punch resistance? I believe it did in that first fight. Right? Understand, the guys I've named here, uh, Gassiev went the distance with Usyk. 
Maris Breedis went the distance with Usyk. Anthony Joshua went the distance with Usyk. You're telling me that Tyson Fury got dropped? Barely made it out of that round? Had to be in survival mode? Yikes. Those are my thoughts on this June 8th, 2024. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Let me hear your opinion in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.